Hey guys and welcome back for another video where I'm going to talk to you all about the books I've read over the past few months. All relatively spoiler free of course. I absolutely love filming these videos, talking about books is one of my favourite things and instead of boring the people in my life who don't really care, I love the little reading community we've created here on my channel. My Goodreads will be linked down below if people want to see the books I'm reading and enjoying in real time. I've got quite good at updating it I think, so if you want to go follow me there, please do. I usually tend to stick to my past 10 books in these videos, but we have a few more this time round. Just because three of them are a series, so I'll be covering them sort of in one. And three of them I already spoke about in my LGBTQ plus books video for last month. And this video will be timestamped, so if you don't want to hear about those again, then you can just skip through and hear about what you do want to hear about. But I do actually have four five star rated books here, just books that I've rated five stars personally, which almost never happens. It takes a lot to like really impress me. I like quite enjoy pretty much everything I read, like within reason, but it takes a lot for me to be like, yes, solid five star. And there's four of them here in this pile. But enough of all my rambling, let's get into the first book, which is actually this. My Dark Vanessa by Kate Elizabeth Russell. It's quite hard to know what to say about this book because I don't want to say I enjoyed it because the subject is not really something to be enjoyed. But what I will say is that it was a very, very good read. It's very intense, very difficult to get through and very dark as the name suggests, but incredibly well written. And this is actually my first five star rating of the video. This is a story of a woman called Vanessa Y and her very twisted relationship with a man who was once her high school teacher. How this man sort of seeped into every aspect of her life, manipulating her in every way to the point that even as an adult, she's unable to look back and see how messed up the relationship was. My Dark Vanessa sort of jumps between the year 2000 with 15 year old Vanessa and the beginning of her relationship with Mr. Strain, her English teacher and I use relationship loosely here, and 2017 where Vanessa's now in her 30s and beginning to come to terms with her past and how that trauma still affects her. Like even 17 years later, she struggles to understand this man as a predator. She's still convinced in their love and you as the reader get to sort of untangle that web of emotions with her. There were points in this book where I actually had to put it down. It's a really hard read at some point. And I can imagine if people have been through something similar, it could be quite triggering. But Vanessa is basically trying to convince you as the reader that this clearly predatory paedophile is a victim himself. That he's this man worth loving. And the book just feels so real, you know? And I feel since reading this, I have a deeper understanding of how girls find themselves in situations such as this one. Because of course, this happens in real life more often than you'd want it to. I always thought that I would literally never be that girl, but I could have been, and we all could have been, if we're targeted by a person like Strain. It genuinely hurt to read this book at some point, but I'm glad I fought through because some people actually have to live this life, not just read it in a fiction book as an outsider. I saw some people online describe it as a modern story of Lolita, but from Lolita's perspective. And I do think I agree with that, although full disclosure, I've only ever watched the film and I've never read the book Lolita. Also, this is a debut novel by Kate Elizabeth Russell, but it reads like she's written hundreds. It reads like she's a veteran. It is so beautifully written. This is getting rave reviews and for good reason. It's amazing. I can't wait to see what Kate Elizabeth Russell comes up with next. Next up, we have Full Disclosure by Cameron Garrett. This is a book that I really, really wanted to love, but I just didn't. It had potential, but I just don't think it quite lived up to it. Um, so this is a story of Simone Garcia Hampton, a HIV positive teenager who's starting a new school and is desperate to keep her HIV status under wraps. The storyline is very similar to sort of Love, Simon kind of vibes. It's an anonymous person threatening to out Simone unless she starts being honest with the people around her. But of course, it's not that simple. As Simone gets into her first relationship, she wants to start having sex, but obviously it's a lot more complicated for her than the standard teenager. So like at what point should she tell her boyfriend Miles and risk his rejection, risk the story getting out? 
The concept of this book is really good and that's what originally drew me in and it is a really cute bit of young adult fiction and I feel like I would have really really enjoyed something like this even five years ago but as I was reading it I just found myself feeling like the writing was really lacking it felt like it was written by a teenager and I actually commented that out loud to my girlfriend I remember when I was reading this before eventually finding out this book was really written by a teenager. Cameron Garrett sold for Disclosure when she was just 16, which is absolutely incredible. And I don't want you to think that I'm saying the writing is bad, because it's not bad, it just felt young, like too young for me now as a 27 year old. It kind of felt to me like Cameron had a tick list as she wrote the book, like HIV, gay dad, bisexual friends, asexual lesbian friend, like tick, tick, tick. Like, don't get me wrong, I love an inclusive book, I'm gay myself, I love how many more queer books are being released at the moment, but it just felt a little bit forced to the point that it didn't feel reflective of real life, like the author was just trying to make some sort of quota to the point where it just didn't feel true. Perhaps that's going to be a really controversial opinion, but it just didn't feel like organic writing to me. I feel like if the writing flowed better, then that would have felt a lot more natural, but it just didn't really. But again, I feel like the topic of this book is really important. I think discussion around HIV is something that still needs to be normalised. I think for a queer questioning teenager, this book would help them be seen, which is probably the most important thing, but it just read to me like more of a fanfic than an actual novel. That being said, I can't wait to see what Cameron Garrett comes out with in the future because this is a really promising start. Find Me by J.S. Munro only got a two star rating from me. I don't have it to show you because I read it on my trusty, trusty Kindle. This book was a battle through to the end and I honestly nearly put it down so many times, but my curiosity got the better of me. I must admit, I did really want to know how this book ended. So that's why it got two stars instead of one, but that's like the only thing I had going for it in my eyes. This is a story of Ja Costello, whose girlfriend Rosa committed suicide when they were both still students at Cambridge. And Ja has never quite been able to get over it. And he sees Rosa everywhere he goes, to the point where he becomes convinced that she's actually still alive. And this thought is further ingrained when Rosa's aunt finds her diary, which has some very intriguing stories about the months leading up to her death. The book is non-chronological, it sort of jumps between the diary and Jar in the present day and he embarks on a mission to untangle the web Rosa left behind in this diary and get answers once and for all. The first reason I found this really hard to get into was because none of the characters are likeable, like literally none. Jar is just an asshole. Rosa is completely unlikable, I wasn't rooting for her to be found if she was alive at all, I just did not care. And secondly, the non-chronological order of this book made it really hard for me to follow the story. It wasn't always clear to me like what was past and what was present. I'd have to stop and then go back a couple of pages to figure out what was going on, which is more hard on a Kindle and I just hate that. It always takes me out of the story and then I get bored and then I just want to put it down. And because part of it is the diary, you find yourself doubting whether the things that are happening are actually real or not. Which I suppose is the point, but I just got really confused thinking certain twists weren't real, and they were, and ugh, I just didn't like it very much. The first half of this book is like a spy kind of thing, Jar is playing detective, and the second half of the book suddenly gets so dark out of nowhere, like it's not one for the faint hearted. I did persevere because I wanted to find out the truth in the end, but honestly I can't even really remember the ending, so <laughs> I think that says it all. Another wonderful five star beauty though is this, Red, White and Royal Blue by Casey McQuiston. I feel like I've already spoken about this book so much on YouTube and Instagram, but I'm sorry, I will never stop. This is officially one of my favourite books of all time and I'm honestly annoyed that I didn't think of the premise of this first. It's so simple, so genius. Alex Claremont Diaz is the first son of the United States who now has their first female president and he's always had this notorious rivalry with the British Prince Henry. But as so is often the trope, it turns out this hatred was born out of love. The sexual tension becomes too much between the two and they find themselves in a secret relationship. On top of all the usual angst which comes with coming out, these two have a lot more to think about than just their immediate family, like they're public figures. 
How would their relationship affect international relations? How would the public take it? Would Alex be risking his mum's re-election chances? And would Henry ever be allowed to live openly in the royal family? I love that this book wasn't just about teenagers. This is about adults in their 20s exploring life and sexuality as adults, which is something that isn't all that easy to come across. A lot of queer fiction is aimed towards teenagers for obvious reasons, but some people are late bloomers. Some people are in their 20s. <laughs> Obviously the situation that Alex and Henry find themselves in isn't all that realistic, but their thoughts and feelings and emotions are, it's weirdly really relatable. It just made my heart so full of love. The love between Alex and Henry is tender and pure, and of course there are obstacles, but the focus is always their love, like making the decision to choose each other again and again, when it seems that everything is against them. I love, love, love both Henry and Alex. Henry is very timid and kind, but with this darkness that you get from years of repression and being unable to be true to yourself, and Alex is strong and always says the wrong thing, but he's always willing to fight for the people he loves. They're both so human and I just root for them so hard. I love it. Plus, Alex is bisexual and I love well done bisexual representation. It's not always done right, but here it so is. Oh, I could talk about this book all day, so I'm gonna stop, but please read this book. I've also mentioned this one in my LGBTQ plus books video, but this is Detransition Baby by Tori Peters. I've now had even longer to process my thoughts and feelings around this book, and I'm pleased to report that those thoughts and feelings are still just overwhelmingly, what the fuck? I want to preface that I don't think this book was necessarily bad, it's just very pretentious I think is the right word. It uses a lot of big words for no reason which makes for very stressful reading when you've got to stop every other page to google definitions. It's just not easy reading. This is a story of Reese, a trans woman who is desperate to be a mother, her ex-partner Ames slash Amy, a trans woman who detransitioned, not so much because they didn't want to be a woman but just because they couldn't handle being sort of on the outskirts of society, and then Ames's new partner Katrina who unexpectedly falls pregnant. The plot is basically that Ames suggests this unconventional family where Reese acts as a second mother to their baby because he can't commit being a male father figure. And the whole book is basically all three main characters coming to terms with the situation, figuring out life. This is definitely not a plot driven book, it's very much just a character study. And honestly, I didn't again find any of the characters all that likeable, especially Reese. It was really hard to root for her as a character. Which I know is not the point in this book, but with no plot and no likeable characters, it was quite hard to get through. Like, I think the author intentionally doesn't water Reese down to become this likeable, kind trans woman, but it was just hard to read when I just thought every page, like, oh, just shut up, just shut up. <laughs> But again, I don't think this was a bad book, which is probably very confusing to you guys. I don't think I'm getting that across at all. It's very interesting and it's different and I think it's an important read because it's a book about trans women written by a trans woman. And it's an angle that cis people probably never think about. And I did enjoy the book as a whole, it was just really hard to get through. Didn't like the characters, but it's really interesting. I don't know, read it for yourself and let me know what you think. If you have read it, then please I'll be very interested to hear your thoughts in the comments because I still can't get my thoughts straight about this one. Next up we have three books in one review. We have Paper Girls, Bad Dog and Three Little Pigs all by Alex Smith. These are all part of the DCI Robert Kett series. It's sort of the classic police procedural thriller genre that I am ever so partial to. I'd never actually heard of this author or series before and the only reason I actually found them is because they were free on Kindle Unlimited and I clearly enjoyed them so much I've now read three and have started the next one in the series as well. They're just very solid gripping crime thrillers, nothing groundbreaking by any means but easy to read, not too traumatising, lots of good storylines and fantastic well rounded characters so like all of these get a solid 4 star review. Starting with Paper Girls. This is your introduction to Robert Kett, who's had to leave the Metropolitan Police in London and move back to his childhood town of Norwich. 
His wife one day was just kidnapped off the street in London with no explanation and after months of relentless searching for her, he's had to think of his three daughters and just remove himself from the situation entirely. But as soon as he arrives in Norwich, his new team there has their own horrible case to solve when a number of paper delivery girls go missing on their routes. This turns out to be one of the darkest cases of Kett's whole career and would even lead some potential answers in his wife's case or just more questions. It's really good, it's a really strong debut for any series. Which leads us into the second in the series, which is called Bad Dog, which in hindsight is probably my least favourite of the three books, but still not bad or unenjoyable by any means, I still really liked it. So this book opens with a young woman being brutally murdered in the countryside, but it doesn't seem like it was committed by a human. It looks to be committed by some kind of large dog. So Ket goes off on a hunt to find out who or what is behind this murder, only to see it happen again with his very own eyes. So now the hunt becomes personal. Again, I did really enjoy this one and it ended on one hell of a cliffhanger that I had to immediately start the next book at like 10 o'clock at night. And yeah, that's, there's not loads to say, they're not groundbreaking like I said, but they're just really good books. Also, I just want to say that I find police procedurals can often be very cold just by the nature of the content, but the relationships between the characters in this series make me feel so warm and fuzzy, like particularly Ket's relationship with his three daughters. It's just so nice and it always sort of lends a little bit of relief to the really dark story. The third book is Three Little Pigs, which seems to be where the storyline at the moment reaches its peak. The wife kidnapping story has sort of been this underlying thing in the last two books and in this one it all comes to a head. Kerr is finally going to get answers as to what happened to his wife, whether she's alive or dead and why she was taken. I would say you could probably quite happily just read these three books as a trilogy in themselves. Three Little Pigs kind of wraps it up quite nicely with a little bow, but I'm 100% going to read all the other ones in the series as well. Three Little Pigs is definitely the darkest book of the three, it's quite unnerving at points and the baddie in this one is quite horrific but I read this whilst I was on holiday so quickly and I even kept stopping to update my girlfriend on what was going on in the book and she was honestly just as enthralled as I was, it was fantastic. She isn't a reader at all but I kept like stopping and being like oh my god Kat's just done this and this character's just done this and she was like oh my god tell me more. <laughs> I should probably say that there are a lot of points in all of these books where Ket is just making stupid choices and you're just screaming at him like what are you doing which I guess some would find really frustrating but like they're books you need to have the character doing stupid things sometimes for the point of the story to progress so if that if you find that kind of thing frustrating then maybe not but I don't care I love it. This book is the final one that I think I mentioned in my LGBTQ plus video and this is Felix Ever After by Kaysen Callender. This book is so cute and it's one I had on pre-order for ages. I was so excited to read it after hearing great preview reviews and whilst I did like the book I don't think it quite lived up to my high high expectations but that's probably on me. I built this one up in my head like a lot. Also just like look how beautiful this book is, like I'm never getting rid of this, it's just so gorgeous. This is going to stay on a bookshelf forever. So this is another book about a transgender teen written by a transgender person and I think that's so important. You can really tell that the author knows and feels what they're writing about. The way that Case and Calendar talks about gender and sexuality is so honest, it covers that grey space within them the sort of like not feeling 100% of anything and how that's totally okay. This is about Felix Love, a black transgender queer teen male who is desperate for love in New York City. Perhaps similar to the premise of Full Disclosure that I mentioned a second ago, one of the main storylines here is Felix receiving anonymous messages or anonymous transphobic threatening messages. And it's no secret that Felix is trans, everyone at the art college he attends knows that, but the messages sort of upset him obviously and he embarks on a mission to find out who's behind them. Also again referring back to Full Disclosure, this book also has so much queer representation but for some reason it feels a lot more natural here, perhaps it's just the writing style or maybe it's the fact of the setting. 
Felix attends an art school in New York City, so it kind of makes sense he'd be surrounded by other queer people. I don't really know what it is, it just feels more natural in this book, it doesn't feel forced at all. I think I said in my last review of this book how the blurb of this really focuses on how Felix has never been in love, so you go into this thinking that that's going to be sort of the main plot of the book, but honestly I don't think it is at all, that's very much a side thing. I think Felix's search for himself, figuring out his own gender and who he really is, is the main driving point of this book. I have been so, so, so excited to share this book with you guys. This is Honey Girl by Morgan Rogers. It's amazing. This is the story of Grace Porter, this sort of type A personality who's got this brand new PhD in astronomy after a lifetime of studying, just trying to prove herself to her very cold and distant father. As a celebration, Grace and her best friends head off on a girls trip to Las Vegas and whilst there Grace finds herself blackout drunk and newly married to Yuki Yamamoto, who then just disappears back home to New York by the time that Grace wakes up the next morning. What follows is Grace's search for herself, for her wife and sort of what she wants to do with her life now she's done her PhD. This is very slow paced with the main plot just being that, Grace figuring out who the hell she is, what the hell she's doing with her life and it's just absolutely freaking beautiful. Although the blurb might make you think otherwise, this isn't really a romance book, this is a book about self discovery and coming of age, but not in your teens, like in your 20s. And this might be the first book I've ever read which is a real reflection of being in your 20s and the turmoil that comes along with that. Like, I've obviously read other books where the characters are in their 20s, but nothing's ever quite made me feel as seen as this one. There's just such a pressure in your 20s to find your place in the world, like do you want to chase education or career or love? Do you want to settle down and buy a house and start having kids? Or do you want to sell everything you own, jump on a plane and spend the next five years travelling? I don't know, but this book just made me feel so seen. As you may have gathered, this is about a lesbian character meeting and marrying a woman, but this isn't a turmoil field coming out story. Grace is out, she knows who she is in that aspect, that's not a question, and it was so refreshing. So much queer fiction is about that discovery and telling people and the trauma of that, and whilst there's 100% a very important place for coming out stories, Sometimes it's just nice to read a book about a gay woman without it being like a thing, you know? Anyway, I am definitely talking too much, but this book is just the best thing in my life. I love it so much. Five stars, ten stars, a million stars. Anyone who's paid any attention to my book videos over the last year will know by now that I am a die-hard Taylor Jenkins Reid fan. Both The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo and Daisy Jones and the Six are two of my favourite books ever. So of course, it's only right that I pre-ordered Malibu Rising by her as well, and let me just say, this did not disappoint. Did I fall in love with this one as much as the others? Not quite, but it's still a very good book and a wonderful story. Taylor Jenkins Reid always manages to capture relationships and family so beautifully. She just has a way of writing that makes you feel everything the character feels, and that just sort of intensifies the relationships between the characters I find. But also the individual characters she creates are just so wonderful, I fall in love with them every single time. On the surface, this is a very basic story about a family, particularly sibling relationships and the love there. And being the oldest of four children myself, this is something that always gets me right in the soul, like sibling relationships in books are always going to be the thing that makes me cry. <laughs> I was just editing this video and realised that my audio inexplicably cut out for like this portion of the video, so if there's a sudden change in angle then that's why. Anyway, this book. So you have two storylines here, you have the 1960s and the story of Mick and June Rivas, how they met and the journey they went on and Mick's journey to fame. Taylor Jenkins Reid has a sort of like ongoing theme of Hollywood and fame in her books and there's even a cheeky mention of a character from Seven Husbands within this book which made me squeal, it's all like within the same universe which is so cool. And then there's the other storyline set in the 80s which focuses on June and Mick's four children and the 24 hours in the lead up to this huge annual summer party they always throw, it's like the biggest night of the year. 
you'd think that because this part of the storyline is told over the space of 24 hours that would be quite slow and monotonous but it absolutely is not. I think having the 60 storyline not only adds much more context to Nina and her siblings as you sort of go through the book but it also breaks up that 24 hours really nicely. So the characters in this book, there's Nina, who are related to on so many levels. She's the oldest child who's always had the responsibility of her siblings on her shoulders. She's the responsible one, never taking time for herself. She's the caretaker, but she doesn't mind or even really notice because she loves her siblings. Then there's Jay and Hud, who are sort of twins, but not twins. They're inseparable, but then something happens which threatens to destroy their relationship. And they have to make the choice how to respond. And then there's the youngest Kit, who's a teenager, and she sort of permanently lives in the shadow of her siblings, but is also probably the most talented. All four Reaver siblings are surfers. Although you could probably argue that Nina is the main character in this, every single character is so well-rounded that you just can't help but fall in love with all the characters, the storyline, everything. Beautiful book, I love it. I'm like, halfway through this kind of monster <laughs> and I can feel myself talking faster and faster throughout this video like I'm literally like starting to get the caffeine shakes I don't usually make a habit of drinking energy drinks but I've got so much work to do that I just need to do it so if I'm talking like a crazy person then that is why <laughs> but anyway the next book is The Lady's Guide to Petticoats and Piracy by Mackenzie Lee this is the sequel to The Gentleman's Guide to Vice and Virtue which I read last year and absolutely loved. I mean obviously because you have to enjoy the first book to be enticed enough to read a sequel. Although I'm sure this book would make enough sense, I think you really need to have the context of the first one to really understand the characters and their motivations and relationships in this book. So the first book in the series is focused mostly on Monty and Percy and how their relationship blossoms as they go on this European grand tour alongside Monty's little sister Felicity who it turns out is desperate to one day become a doctor in the 1700s. A world which isn't all that kind to women. This book is about Felicity and that journey to become a doctor. She is determined to do whatever it takes to make men pay attention to her. There's this one particular doctor called Alexander Platt who she's just idolised her entire life. And when she hears that he's marrying her childhood best friend Joanna, she heads off to Germany to reunite with Joanna under the guise of getting close to her husband-to-be. Only of course things are not as they seem and soon Felicity, Joanna and this girl called Sim end up on a journey across Europe. This is essentially a story of what it was like to be a woman in the 18th century. The expectations placed a woman to marry whoever first offered their hand, to have kids and just be satisfied with that. Well, what happened if a woman wasn't satisfied with that existence? This book is just pure feminist rage and I love it. The character of Felicity can be quite grating at times, she's not the most likeable, and she's very insistent on rejecting anything to do with womanhood. But Joanna is the opposite, she's this badass woman who's super smart and fun and loves to wear pink dresses and makeup while she's at it. I just love this book and I cannot wait to read the final book in the series as well. It is so good, just so fun. And ending on lucky number 13, we have Q by Christina Doucher. I was very apprehensive going into this book because I've previously read Fox by the same author, of which I absolutely loved the premise, but I just feel like it wasn't explored enough. The book just didn't go anywhere and it was really frustrating. So I was worried that Q would be the same, but I'm happy to announce that it absolutely was not. This book was so good. Q is about a dystopian America in which every single person's success in life is based on something called their Q score. Not quite, but basically like if your school GPA or grades followed you through the rest of your life. The government is attempting to make a perfect world in which everyone is smart and performing to the best of their abilities, meaning that schooling happens in a tier system. There's silver for the best of the best, green and then yellow for those children who are considered to be failing. Yellow children are taken off on a yellow school bus to state boarding schools for their education and parents are only allowed to visit once a quarter under very strict rules. But even adults' lives are controlled by their queue scores. The highest scores get to skip the queues at the supermarket, buy the nicest houses, etc. If you miss a day at school, no, if you miss a day at work, your queue score would go down. 
I love a dystopian novel, but it's got to be done right, and Q definitely was. It holds this perfect amount of suspense, you never know what's around the corner, and when I tell you, I gasped at the ending. The main protagonist here is a woman called Elena Fairchild, whose husband Malcolm is one of the main people responsible for this education and tier system being the way it is now. When one of their children ends up failing her test and ends up at the yellow school, Elena has to make a decision about what's best for her family and how far she'll go to bring her daughter back. Christine Doucher has definitely redeemed herself in my eyes after Vox with this book. I absolutely loved it, I thought it was so well written and such a cool premise. So there you go, there are 13 books which I've read recently. Most of them I actually really enjoyed, this was a really good bunch of books. But please let me know in the comments what books you've been reading or what you think I'll like based on what I've enjoyed here. I love getting new book recommendations, my list on Goodreads is literally hundreds of books long. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Mwah. Bye guys!